up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Blood on the Razor Wire TV, where we bring it to you real and we bring it to you raw. If you haven't already, hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, share the video, and make sure you leave a comment. I got a real special guest on today. I think it's better if I let him introduce himself. Tell the people who you are. The microphone's yours, brother, and tell them kind of a little bit about you. Hey, Shed, uh, everybody watching, my name's Mike Cadella. I'm a retired NYPD Detective Sergeant, I work in a bunch of cool units here in New York City, DEA, Secret Service, uh, special unit called Operation 8, and um, I did some pretty cool, pretty interesting cases, man, out here in New York. I know you did a bunch of interesting cases, but I kind of want to talk about your upbringing in the beginning, right? Your father was a cop, correct? Yep. Were the streets calling you the wise guys in the beginning? Um, you know, as a kid, I grew up in Brooklyn, Kanasi, Brooklyn. And uh, like a lot of other neighborhoods, but especially in Brooklyn, uh, the mob and, and, and that lifestyle is very prevalent. You know, it's right in front of you. Some of my best friends growing up, their fathers were uh, well-connected, pretty important guys in the mob. And yeah, it was right in front, you know, I, I don't know if they was calling me, but it was, yeah, it was right in front of me my whole life. I think I read something where there was an incident where one of the guys wanted you to do something, a stick up or something. And what choice did you end up making? So it was a, a, one of my friends, not a super close friend, but a guy I'd see, you know, once in a while. Back, back when we were young, when we were very young, we lived right next to each other, basically. But um, kind of lost touch a little bit, but we, we still kept in you know, contact. And I ran into him, and he wanted to know if I wanted to get involved with this. Probably some, some bar that was shut down. Basically going there and taking out all these old Joker poker machines, some, some other gambling machines that were... Uh, kind of common in these joints in New York. And it was run by the mob. All those Joker poker machines were run by the mob. And in this particular case, Eddie Lino, who was a John Gotti, good friend, uh, Lieutenant for Gotti, um, he wanted these machines out. So we, we were going to go in there and get them on his behalf. Well, you know, I was like 16, 17, and I thought it was something kind of fun to do, kind of interesting, you know, and I did it. Me and these guys, we did it. And then Eddie Lino, who is a known killer, he's a, he's a capable guy. He's, he's, we knew we knew him, we knew of him, we knew his reputation. He kind of didn't really want to pay and um, for, for, for do, taking these machines out. And he was just an arrogant guy, you know, and, and literally I think he, because he knew I was a little upset with the way things were going, um, I felt like he really wanted to put a bullet in my head, honest to God. And I was a kid, I was 16, 17, and he was – being real cheap for, for a couple of dollars that he owed me, owed everybody. And um, it left a really bad, and I'm happy, it left a really bad taste in my mouth of what these guys are all about, which is basically, it's all about the dollar, man. So they didn't really give a shit about you, and for a couple of dollars, he's like, ah, he's just a kid, get out of here. And you end up making different decisions. You end up, you know, going and end up becoming a cop, right? Yeah, I, like I said, I seen the way he was, and I had some other dealings with some other guys in that life. And um, so, tr I, I, as you know, and, and I'm sure most of your, your followers know, it's a treacherous life. And like I said, it's not about uh, camaraderie. It's not about friendship. It all comes down to number one, taking care of themselves, taking care of the, you know, making sure they have the, the dollar bill in their pocket. And um, because I saw that at a young age, at a young younger age, I would say. Um, it kind of, instead of bringing, bringing me in, kind of spooked me out, out of dealing with that, that stuff. So you end up becoming, what, a beat cop in the beginning? Yeah. First, I, I was a cop out in Coney Island. That's where I started. Um, I did about a year in Coney Island. You know, it's quite by things in Coney Island. is such a touristy attraction with beaches. And I didn't work that area, man. I worked in Coney Island where it was gritty ghetto, uh, shootings every day and, and hustling and drugs, you know, crack, it, crack was, this was 1984, crack was everywhere. So um, that, that's why, that's why I initially came on as a uniform cop. That I was going on. But then you end up in the narcotics unit, right? A bunch of heroin back then, the Guy Fisher days and Nikki Barnes, all of that stuff. The community's being destroyed. I mean, we're not going to, you know, beat around the bush and act like, well, we're the YouTube channel and we're for the streets. I mean, I'm for the people, right? So when you're out there, your your mindset is now, hey, look, we're going to go clean these neighborhoods up. Is that what you're thinking in your head? 
when, when I was up, when I was going to the police academy, uh, usually I, I would take the train to the police academy from from Brooklyn. Uh, and every once in a while, I get a ride with my a kid who was in my academy class, whose friend, whose brother, I was actually very very close with his brother. This was his younger brother, and we happened to be in the same academy class together. And their father would take me every once in a while to the police academy. You know, I'd catch a ride with him in the sun to the academy. One day we were, on a few occasions, we'd drive, take a shortcut, we'd drive down Alphabet City, which I, I frequented Manhattan a lot as a kid with my teenage friend. We'd go to 42nd Street, 42nd and 8th Avenue, Broadway. And that's a real, that was a real uh, horrible place for kids to be. I should have never been down there. Nothing but perverts, and, and I can't even tell you how bad it was. But it wasn't what I saw in Alphabet City, where I would see lines of people, junkies and functioning junkies, and guys that didn't look too bad, and then you would see guys standing next to them doing the nods. They were <coughs> literally online waiting to, <coughs> to cop dope. And I didn't know what they were doing. I would ask my friend's father, who was a cop also. He was in a SWAT team in New York City. I said, well, what's going on here? And he would say, well, this is Alphabet City. This is Low East Side. Everybody knows about it. This is where the heroin is. The city doesn't mind it being contained in this area. And um, it was just mind blowing that there would be lines and lines of people waiting orderly with their money out and, and the city let this shit go on. And um, basically when I got, I, I wanted to transfer out of Coney Island and I wanted to go down from the city and see if I could make a difference. So in your heart, you really want to clean up this neighborhood. You're not from there. You don't live there, but you want to go clean this up. Uh, you know, I got there with the intentions of, you know, I was a young cop. I was, act, you know, I wanted to be active and I hooked up with another young guy, another young cop, from, a guy from Brooklyn who lived not far from me. And we met in the police academy. We hit it off. He worked at Coriolan for a short time. Then he went back to Alphabet City. And we talked on the phone. He said, Mike, you got to come down here. You got to come down here. We'll work together. Well, I went down there with the intentions of working together, you know, getting big, keeping busy and locking people. Then I would see little kids. Bro, they, little, little kids picking up empty glass scenes of, of heroin because yeah. they were all over and playing with them. And then they'd have the, the dope shit on their hands. And then they'd be kicking hypodermic needles around or, or picking them up and playing sword fighting with bloody hypodermic needles. And I said, what? How can people live like this? You know, when they, yeah, the place is filled with drug addicts and heroin users and guys coming in from other, other places to buy it. But there's legitimate people here, good people, look at these little kids. And that's when I said, you know, we, you know, I, then it became like a mission, you know, mission, more or less. I respect that mission. Let me say this, right? When you're going, when, when you're doing all this drug stuff in the Alphabet City and all of that stuff, are you going in drug houses? Do you have to bust in houses? Are you part of the narcotics team? Or are you just doing it, you and your partner? Well, we did both. So first we were in uniform and then we were, we were, we made a lot of arrests in uniform. And then we were put in a special unit called Operation 8. And that was a federally government funded unit. And it was the eight stood for the eight worst projects in Alphabet City. That's what we were, our unit was focused on. And um, it was made mostly narcotics and, and guns. We make other arrests if they, you know, if we happen to fall upon them. But we were looking to do drugs. So yeah, we busted, busted every kind of drug den and heroin shooting gallery and apartments and you name it. Uh, I, I'm asking you that to ask you this, right? When you're getting ready to go into a house, what's the mentality of the police officers? Are they like, man, are you nervous? Are you scared? Is your adrenaline pumping? Are you like, damn, I got a wife and kids at home. I might not make it out of here. What are the things that enter a police officer's mind that's going into a, a house like this? Yeah, I mean, I, I would, for the most part, I almost always carry the, the, the ram, right? Uh, I was a little bit bigger and stronger then, and maybe that was one of the reasons. And 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 yeah, and yet you're really thinking about getting in number one, but you're thinking about the guy, your partners behind you, number two. Um, and I was single at the time. I, I was a single most of the time. When I was in narcotic, so really I wasn't worried about you know my wife or kids at home. I didn't have that concern, which I was glad. You know, looking back, I'm glad I did not have that concern. But um, yeah, because you never know what's behind the door. You hit the door, it could be guys waiting with guns. There are little kids in there, your babies in there. You, your partner's got his gun cock, or maybe not cock, but he's got his gun pointed almost almost at the back of your head. So there's so many things going through your head. And really, you're looking to survive, and you're looking really... I mean, people don't get... We're not looking to go in and hurt anybody. We're not looking to go in and shoot people, kill people. 
you know, that's not what we're looking to do. Of course it happens, but, um, you know, you're looking to get in, get in quick, get the upper hand on these people and lock them up, you know? Get in there and lock them up. Let me ask you this, right? When you arrest some of these guys, you get them in the car, how many times are they like, hey, man, I don't want to go to jail. Let's work something out. Uh, you know, it happens a lot. A lot of times guys want to give information. Sometimes they have information worthwhile that we can help them out with. Uh, sometimes we don't, sometimes we don't even want to deal with them because they don't have enough for us or we don't trust them, you know, but you know, I got to be honest with you, right? we don't, for the most part, I mean, there were guys that I knew, you know, I, me and my partner worked the same area for quite a few years. So we worked there from like 84 up until 90, 91, actually, when we went, we actually went to DEA, we stayed in Alphabet City doing a big case. So we worked there for quite a few years. I got to watch little kids grow up to be, you know, adults almost. Um, there were people that I knew that I despised because of their attitude towards other people, because for them, again, it went, it went to making a buck. They didn't care how many people were beat on their shit or where they were selling in front of kids and they didn't care. For them, it was all about money. And there were some people that I despised. But for, for the most part, I didn't get a kick out of locking people up, so to speak, or sort of, you know, I wasn't, I didn't cherish putting people behind bars for many years. But I'm, of course, it was part of the job. And I did, I did enjoy taking the dope off the street, not in a view of the people and, and the kids. But um, again, like I said, there were a lot of individuals that I really despised that I, I really wanted to get. And, you know, we tried to get. Um, as far as people talking to us, not, not so much when they were in handcuffs, but since me and my partner knew everybody, we knew everything that was going on down there, I can't tell you how many people used to come and give us information. Dealers, users, civilians. Um, it was amazing, bro. I can't even tell you. We knew, we would know what dope was coming out with a special brand or stamp, and who it belonged to, even before it hit the streets. It was really crazy. Unbelievable. You go in these houses, you bust them, they're taking the mom to jail, you're taking the father to jail. There's little kids crying, mommy, mommy. How do you feel as a police officer when you're confronted with that type of situation? Yeah, man, it's not fun. You know, really, you got a kid, you know, this is way before, like I said, before I had kids, but I always liked kids, you know. Yeah. Uh, and my partner too. He, both of us. It's kind of funny. We both really love kids, and um, it, it's, you know, it's heartbreaking. But in the same terms, we're taking their parents away, and hoping that they get something better. Because, bro, you see, the, I, I know, I know, kid. I don't have to tell you, and I'm sure I don't have to tell your listeners or your followers. But there's a lot of it just be <clears throat> perpetuates. So the fa grandfather, the father, the son, the grand, you know, it just stays in the family sometimes. And sometimes, you know, these kids don't, some of them don't have a shot. They don't have a shot in hell of getting out of there. So when we took their parents away, it was heartbreaking. But, some, you know, in the same sense, you say maybe the kid will have a shot now of a better life. I understand what you're saying. But, you know, a lot of times the mother will get out of jail. The father goes to prison. The kids are growing up without a father. You know, a lot of times the mother becomes the child's friend and not the mother. Um, I'm a firm believer in, you know, kind of change, right? And I taught classes in prison. I taught, one, I taught one that was called Leaders Breed Leaders. We were trying to teach dudes how to go home and be real fathers, real men, real leaders to stop that vicious cycle that you just talked about from the father to the son to the son and all the way down, right? What do you think the biggest issue was with, you know, 16, 17-year-olds out there selling heroin on the block? In your mind, why do you think they were out there doing that shit? Um, oh, it comes, it's like, like, you, like we start the conversation with the mob guys. It comes down to being one of impressing females. It comes down to wanting to have money, nice cars, jewelry. I mean, bro, I you know I always said if you if you if I know it can never happen, but if there was a law saying girls couldn't talk to drug dealers, bro, you see how fast this shit would stop. They they get they want they, you know they want their money, they want their cars, they want to impress girls, they want you know have nice girl looking girlfriends. And that's what it's all about. And impressing each other. Uh, it's, you know, it, it just perpetuates. So they see it, they want it. You know, it comes out. And then again, it come, a lot of times it comes down to greed. You know, just buying a car is not enough. Just moving out of a project ain't enough. 
They want to move out of projects. They want not a house. They want a mansion. They don't want one mansion. They want two mansions. I mean, we walked up so many guys who started out in the projects that ended up multi-million. You know, people don't realize heroin, I don't know about all over the country, but New York City, heroin was where the money was. Not crack, no, not coke, not methamphetamine, none of that shit. It was dope. And these guys made, we're talking 17, 18-year-old kids driving around with Lamborghinis, Ferraris, and that was before you could lease a car. There were no leasing cars. So when you had a Lamborghini, that means you spent $120,000 to buy that car. Or a Ferrari, $140,000. That's what these kids were doing, man. And, um, you know, they wanted to impress each other, impress the girls, and that was it. Those are the guys that make it big. But how about the guys that are sitting in drug houses, right? I put a little video up today, a little short, right? And I'm going to probably do a video on this. But this kid that I know, he was my cameraman at one time. He worked at Taco Bell. He was making five fifty a week. He's back smoking drugs. He's living in a house. He sends me these pictures. They got a board on the door. They got drugs in there. And he's got a little shoot that he's you know sending the money. I said, how much are you making? He said, man, they're probably making ten grand a week here, but they're paying me three fifty a week. I said, dude, you just took a pay cut to take a chance with your life. You went from working at Taco Bell at five fifty a week, working with me, making a little extra money as far as my cameraman goes, to sitting in a drug house smoking three hundred fifty dollars worth of crack for free for sitting in this house. So when you bust a guy, right, and maybe he's not a drug addict, and you run in these houses, you got the seventeen, eighteen year old kid that's don't have nothing. He's making five hundred a week. What are you thinking in your mind about him? Do you think that? The streets are better when you take him off the street and put him in prison for, let's say, a one and a half to three or a two to six. Uh, and I'm, I'm going somewhere with this question, but I want yeah. you to answer that. Uh, I, you know, I, I can't. It's up. You know, I, I'm trying to picture. I don't really remember too many people working in these houses that didn't use dope or that didn't have a, a problem. Uh, I, and I, you know, uh, I have it. Um, you know, the thing about the Lower East Side, which I don't know how we do, you know, Alphabet City, Lower East Side. Uh, everybody, I hate, and I hate to use, I got to generalize, but 90% of the people, maybe high, 95% all use dope. If it wasn't, so they didn't consider another person a junkie if they only snorted a bag of dope or two bags or three bags. Snorted dope, three bags a day. They, were, they didn't consider themselves a junkie. They didn't consider the other guy a junkie. They only considered a guy a junkie if he was shooting dope and if he was shooting a lot of dope. So these guys that were hustling and maybe not making a lot of money, they were hustling, but they, they had habits. They, you know, they were dope users, dope, dope addicts, and, and they all had habits. I don't think I've ever crossed anybody involved in that business other than maybe the hierarchy guys that didn't have a habit. And even the hierarchy guys, some of them, when I grabbed them, I was shocked to find out that they actually were dope addicts, you know, users. I'll tell you a quick story, if, if, if I can, a real quick story. Yeah. But there was a guy that came out of jail. Came out of a joint, uh, came out all big and strong looking. And he used to give me my, now you remember, me and my partner worked there for years. We knew everybody. He came out, he was all big and husky, and looked really good. Good looking guy, Puerto Rican guy. Uh, and he kind of looked hard at me and my partner. You know, in the beginning, he kind of looked hard at us. So right off the bat, we didn't like him because uh, it looked like he wanted to have a confrontation with us. Eventually, we get to know him. He wasn't a bad guy. We actually got to, I actually got to like him. I used to call him Ace. I could give the nickname because nobody called him that except me and my partner. And that's because he wore a leather jacket with an Ace of Spain on the back. So we just started, I started calling him Ace. Anyway, um, I got to like the guy. One day, me and my partner looked to make a call and they're, they're dealing me out of one of the buildings, 10 Avenue D, which was a corner building, 10th uh, Avenue D in Houston Street. They're dealing, they're dealing out. We're seeing junkies come out of there. All right. So we grab a couple of junkies. Yeah, yeah, the guy's right there in the first floor. Dealing right out of the floor. Right off, not in the not in the apartment, right out of the floor. Okay, grab a couple, put them in the car. Somebody had them. We went in. We don't go to get the dealer. We see this guy Ace. Now I knew he I knew he hustled. I knew it, but we never you know I never had to lock him up. So and I didn't lock up everybody I grabbed that was dirty. I gave a lot of guys breaks and they give me information and that's a you know I I talk about it. I worked uh, not on the on the hundred percent level. I did shit that I wasn't supposed to do to get the bigger guy to. The ends justify the means. I always thought that. So now, anyway, I got Ace. I said, Ace, bro, you're dealing right in 10 Avenue D. You know I'm working. Oh, I'm sorry. I said, I was going to let him go. I toss him, and I come up with a bunch of packages. I don't remember how many, five, 600 bags of dope. I said, Ace, man, I can't let you go. Not with this. If it was 10 bags, 20, I'll let you go. I said, I can't let you go with 600 bags of dope, bro. Uh, and he understood. All right, all right. 
they call me Rambo. All right, Rambo, man, I'm sorry, bro. All right, I got to go. You got to go. I got to take you. All right. He said, can you do me a favor? Yeah, what's up? Can you let me get high? I'm going to get sick. I said, bro, Ace, you, you, you use? He said, yeah, man, I, I, got, I got a little habit here. Now, like I said, he was, he was starting to trim down. He's not as big as he was, but he still looked good. He's a good-looking kid, good-looking guy. I said, all right, Ace. So I gave him a bag of dope. He said, Rambo, this ain't going to cut, man. I said, all right, give him another bag. He said, this ain't going to cut. I said, bro, how many bags of fucking dope you need, man? He said, I need 10 a day, man. I need 10. If you don't give me 10 bags of dope, I'm going to get sick. So I had to give this guy 10 bags of dope to just function. Is that unbelievable? Just to function so I could take him to jail and he don't get sick overnight in, in the joint. Ain't that crazy? Yeah, I mean, my real father was a was a drug addict, man. He died, you know, he, he overdosed. He died getting high. So, no, I, I mean, I, I know it. And like I said, I was going somewhere with the question, right? And what I, where I was going was I believe that a lot of these kids, and, you know, like you said, a lot of – most people aren't sitting in a drug house for $350 a week, $500 a week, unless they're on dope. But, you know, we got 16, 17-year-old kids, and I'm going to relate this to my city, running around killing each other, selling crack. You know, they're buying a half ounce of crack, they're bagging it up, and they're making $400 profit, they're selling it on a Friday night, and they think they got something, right? But why do you think these 16, 17-year-old kids are selling crack that that don't use? Is it because there's no father in the home, no no family structure? Do you think that? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, absolutely. So that, you know, I, I, again, I don't have to tell you, you've been around, you, your viewers have been around. They idolize the, the guys that aren't, you know, it's what they know. It's what, they, what, they, what they're what they attracted to. They don't have a father to sit them down or to look up to or, you know, uh, let's, the Bronx sale, that, that, that line that Chaz Palmentary says, the, tough, yeah. the real guy or the real man or the real tough guy is the guy that goes to work, work. every morning. They don't see that. They see the guy, you know, hustling. That's the, that's, to them, that's the man. And they don't have a father figure, man. It's a... It's a it's tough, man. It's really tough. It's sad. It's really sad. You know, I didn't see that either. I ended up with a 40-year federal mandatory minimum because I didn't see that. And, it, you know, it took a long time. It probably took me nine, ten years to finally start to see that. And eventually I got out. You know, my judge went out on a limb for me, you know, to say the least. He didn't have to let me out of jail. And he took probably some flack by doing it. And he was a little bit nervous. In fact, my judge actually wrote me a letter, you know, and I've read it on my on my oh, website. Nice. And, wow. you know, what? he took a shot at letting me out of jail, I was I was supposed to die or get out when I'm 63, I think, or 64. He took a shot at it. And you know what? Now I'm home. I'm remarried to my ex-wife. I have two little, you know, boys that are two twin seven-month-old boys. And that's what I want to be, man. I want to be a husband. I want to be a father. I want to lay down that structure so my boys don't go through what I went through. I want to stop that. I want to cut that off. But let me ask you this. And you know what? Some of the viewers might get mad when I say this. I don't think it's fixable. I think you can save some people along the way. But it's so out of control. How do you fix it? Is it fixable in your mind? You're a New York City sergeant, you know, narcotics, police officer. You've been around a long time. Do you think you could ever fix this? I'll give you, let me tell you something. There used to be this kid that uh, lived in the projects. He was a little guy. Little, you know, when I would say kid, he was like seven, six, seven, eight years old when we met him. We used to see him on the street. We used to play football with him, you know, have a couple of catches back and forth. They never know a man in the house. He used to come over. Talk to me, my partner. Can I see this? Can I see your handcuffs? And we used to, you know, spend time with the kid, you know. And uh, little by little, I was watching him. Eight years old turns to ten years old, turns to thirteen years old. He didn't want to look at me. Would barely say hello to me. Fourteen years old, fifteen years old. Now he's actually got his own brand of dope. Now he don't want nothing to do with me. And I was aggravated as hell with him. Wouldn't even say hello to me. He gets fucking killed when he's like 17, 18 years old, man. Um, he just fell into the life, you know. He, you know, he, he had an old man. He, he took part in what he knew. He's, these kids groom him. They just like the mom. I've said this recently on somebody else's show. Just like the mom grabs these young Italian kids and kind of grooms them and you know shows them the ropes, so to speak. That's what happens to these kids. They get groomed. They look at the money. The guy says, "Oh, I'll take care. I'll hook you up," and then this kid gets killed. They become yeah. a product of their environment, so to speak. Right, Mike? Yeah, exactly, bro. Right? And, and really, man, before the grace of God, man, I always said that. Could be anybody, you know? 
You know, my city's going through like a state of emergency right now, right? Um, they had us on Fox News not too long ago, said we were one of the most dangerous cities in the country to live in. We had more murders than Chicago per person. About three or four days ago, this kid shoots two cops, shoots one in the head, I, I, maybe in the chest. He kills the cop. The cop's dead. The, his partner returns fire. He gets shot. He goes to jail. The next day, now they announced a state of emergency eight hours before these cops get killed, right? They get killed. Next day, we got another murder. Last night, we had another murder. I mean, the murders are just out of control. Let me ask you this. When a cop gets killed, I mean, this was full court press. I don't think they announced it until the next day, but they said they had this kid within an hour. So when a cop gets killed, I mean, what happens? Is it total panic at the police department? I mean, how do they catch this guy so fast? I mean, is it I mean, full court know, press? Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, it's a full court press, man. They take every... Every detective, every capable detective, they put them on the case. They try to, everybody who knows anybody gets grabbed and shaken. Every tree gets shaken and whatever pulls out, they don't just nonchalant that they investigate everything, man. And then eventually somebody hopefully comes forward or they grab the right guy who knows something and gives it, somebody gives it up. I mean, that, you know, but of course it's manpower. Um, of course, manpower, of course, money, time. It, it can't, they can't do that with every homicide, especially like, in your neighbor, you know, in yeah. your town or neighbor, whatever, they, they can't do that. But when a cop, you know, that's a total, when a cop gets killed or shot at, that's a total disrespect for for the law, for society. You know, you got, that, that's got to stop. You know, that, that, they got to they gotta put their foot down and go after these guys when that happens. I mean, I think you agree there are some good cops, there's some bad cops, right? Absolutely. My questions might be a little different probably than what you're used to, huh? <laughs> Well, <laughs> it's fine. Okay. So now let me ask you this, all right? We got a parole officer here in Buffalo, New York. He goes in this guy's house. They're searching. He ends up planting a twenty two bullet on the guy. He doesn't know that the police respond. Now, this is a parole officer, New York State parole officer. The police respond. The police got camera, cameras on their, on their thing, right? They respond. He's caught. He plants a twenty two bullet on this guy's dresser next to his prison ID. The guy's going to trial. He's facing double-digit numbers. He's going back to prison for a long time. Felon in possession of ammunition. He's looking at some serious time. The lawyers, they're on the trial. They're, you know, they're looking over the video and they're like, holy shit, look, look. They see the cop plant the 22 bullet, the, the parole officer. But only because the police had body cameras. If that cop didn't have a body camera, that kid be in prison right now. I think he ends up getting acquitted, whatever. It just happened a few weeks ago. What do you guys think, man, when you're a cop, right? You're, what do you think when there's a dirty cop that does some shit like that? Does that bother you? Yeah, man. You know, I, I, I got to say, bro, even though it's kind of cliche, but nobody hurts, nobody hates a dirty cop more than a good cop. Because it, fuck, it screws us up, it, you know, it hurts us. Um, a lot of, because of the way me and my partner did things, like I said, we, we did things off the, you know, against regulations and some shit was illegal. But we never did it to make money. I never took a dime. I never made a dime doing any of that shit. What I did was look to get the bigger fish. And I risked my job. I risked, risked my career. Um, and, and so did my partner. Um, you know, we took those kind of risks. But when a guy was out there doing bad shit, cops, man, that really makes it bad for everybody. And that's why... Nobody really, honestly, nobody hates a dirty cop more than more than a good cop. But all the years I've been out there, and I, and I say this all the time, um, all the years I've been out there, no cops ever did shit in front of me. It's almost like um, you're not going to do stuff in front of a guy that don't want no part of it and don't believe in that shit and ain't going to put up with it. So nobody, I, I know there were dirty cops out there. Nobody ever did anything in front of me. So if you ask me, Mike, how many dirty cops did you ever deal with? I don't know any. Uh, I know one or two got arrested. I knew who they were. They worked in my command. I was friendly with them. I never worked with them. When they got arrested, I was shot. You know, I was actually, one of them actually got arrested in the Lower East, like cop and dope. He was a dope addict. I, I, I wasn't that friendly with him. I didn't know him that well. But obviously, he was up to no good. <clears throat> but um, you, if, even if I was working with him, he would have never done that shit in front of me because he knew that wasn't me. So... I can only say I really don't know. I didn't deal with any dirty cops. Let me say this. I was cellmates with Steve Caracappa for about five or six days, right? 
And sometimes they say, I don't know, you've probably heard this saying, right? There's a thin line between cop and criminal. You ever heard that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I'm going to say this. You, you know, you said, look, I was risking my career. You know, I, I would make, you know, different decisions. I was going to let Ace go if it was 10 bags, 20 bags, but I couldn't let him go with this much. But honestly, when you're in that line of work, I mean, the higher ups, they do turn a blind eye because that's how you get to where you need to go to get whoever you feel you need to get. So they do turn their turn a blind eye, correct? I got to be honest again, bro. They, they don't. And nobody does. I, I don't know anybody did what me and my partner did, to be honest. I wouldn't do it in front of anybody but my partner. Uh, the, the other guys in my unit, the op, the Operation A unit, were really a tight, tight guys. It was only five of all of us plus a sergeant. Um, we were really tight, but I only did this with my partner. He only did it with me. Um because I don't want to risk your job, bro. I'm not going to yeah. do shit that you don't do, and I'm not going to risk your job. And as far as the hierarchy, the hierarchy goes, or the supervisors, they're not to, bro, they're on a on a trajectory to be chief for whatever they aspiration they have, or to be a super chief or an inspector. And they're not they're yeah. not going to put up with Mike Cadella doing something fucked up. You know what I mean? Or in, antsy. Well, let me ask. Let me let me switch it around and ask you this way, then. In the beginning of the interview, you said in the inner cities, they were kind of like, you know, in Manhattan, whatever, in that, that part of the area. Let's contain it here. Let's keep all the drug addicts and the undesirables in this area because this is what the hierarchy, this is what the administration wants. They don't want these guys coming into Bensonhurst on the corner doped out. They don't want these guys in, you know, in, you know, in Manhattan, certain areas where the affluent people are passed out on the curb at that time, right? I mean, a lot of that stuff ended up happening, and Giuliani comes in, and he fixes a lot of that stuff to a certain extent. But, I mean, they would turn a blind eye to just keeping it in that area. Let's just keep it there, right? Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That's And that was going on for, I don't even know how many years, from the 70s, 60s or 70s. Dope addicts went to Alphabet City to cut their dope. And, um, and I, I, I hate to use this expression, but it worked. The dope was in Alphabet City. And who suffered were the poor people in the projects. So it was kind of a compromise, right? I mean, let's keep the undesirables over here so that they don't come over here and destroy this. And, you know, it's so far out of control nowadays that they can't do that. I went to prison. When I went to prison, you didn't see people standing on the corner with these. And most of these people are drug addicts. I'll work for food or, I, you know, I can't. I'm, I'm One lady, you know, for example, one lady had a sign not too long ago. She says, I'm too old to prostitute, too honest to steal. I want to get high. And I'm like, I never seen this shit before I went to prison. And now everybody's doing it. They can no longer contain it. It's all over the place. You're right. I mean, it's it's an epidemic. So I want to go back. I want to go back to my question earlier where I asked you, do you think it's fixable? Because I don't. I think it's, I think you can help. You can help change the course of some people's lives. But I feel that this is so out of control. I don't see how you fix it. Yeah, I don't know what you mean. I, I'm not being a wise guy here either. I don't know what you mean by fix it. Can I say, listen, there was a kid named Mario, and I remember everybody's name, believe it or not, from back in nineteen in the eighties. There was a kid Mario. He was my age. I, you know, when I came on a job, I was in my, I was twenty one. I worked at Coney Island for a year. I was twenty two, twenty three. I worked out. So I, when I was dealing with these guys, we were all the same age, and they were. I called them kids. I was a kid. I find these guys on some of them have a YouTube channel, Alphabet City, and I watch them, and, I, and they put pictures of photographs. Polaroids, and I'm like, holy shit! I used to. These are the guys that I was going after. They were kids, but I was a kid. I was, you know, 23 years old myself. But anyway, there was a kid, Mario. Like I said, 23, 24. Came over to me one day. I'm staying on that Avenue D with my partner. He came over to me. I said, Mario, I'm a senior. He said, Yeah, I don't come down here anymore. He was a user, but he was a sharp looking kid though. He worked, he had a legit job. He worked. Uh, I said, Mario, where you been, man? I'm a senior. He said, Yeah. You and your partner locked me up. And he was in and out of jail. He didn't do time, maybe a couple of days. He said, you and your partner locked me up a couple of times. I'm so afraid of getting locked up by you guys. I don't get high anymore. I just come down here to see my mother. I don't get high anymore thanks to you and your partner. And that's only one guy. There was other guys, but that one guy stuck in my head. So did I save his life? I like to think I did. Did I save everybody's life? No, of course, you know, can't, can't do it. Well, that- At least Mario, unless he fell off the wagon, which I hope not. I think we did okay with we were, you know, him and some others, I hope. No, I mean, that that's kind of my mission is to save as many kids from life imprisonment and premature death in the streets as we can, right? But we can't save everybody. I think it's just out of control. 
But let's talk, I mean, I know you did some big cases. Maybe we'll get into a couple of those here in a second. But, you know, you said your name was Rambo. They called you Rambo. I know you speak fluent Spanish. Um, and they called you Rambo. We had a cop in my neighborhood that they called Rambo. And he got that moniker for the fact that he was just a crazy dude. He'd jump out of bushes on you. He, I mean, he'd do all kinds of crazy stuff. How did you get the name Rambo? Basically, I mean, like, I, I used to have a little beard, you know, like a tight beard, like Stallone. I chased the dude. One day I chased the dude, uh, some black guy came to cop. He didn't know me and my partner, and he actually caught a couple of bags, whatever he did, and he ran from us, and I chased him, and I caught him. And then when he turned around, he, of course he ain't going to, he don't want to go to jail. And I didn't pull my gun, because what am I going to do with my gun? Shoot him? I'm not going to shoot the guy. So it actually turns into a, a fight or a wrestling match, you know what I mean? I got to cuff this guy, he's going to jail. I'm chasing him, he stops, and that's it. And I got the better of him, and you know how people, get, you know, after the city, everybody's out, nobody works, and they've made a circle, they watch it. And it was like a big uh, form of entertainment, and that's how I originally got the name. So you kind of look like Stallone a little bit. You went out the morning. <laughs> and the other thing is you're part of the fight game, right? A little bit, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think you train fighters, and you, you have a gym? Yeah, I got a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Academy <clears throat> uh, in Staten Island. I'm a black belt on the Hensel Gracie, so I've trained with the Gracies for many years, so yeah. Who's your favorite UFC fighter? Uh, oh, that's a good question, man. That's a great question. Uh, uh, George St. Pierre, man. I trained with him. He's a good guy. A lot of heart. Uh, George St. Pierre. I think he's a good fighter. I used to love Forrest Griffin. I want to okay. talk. I want to talk a little bit about some of the big cases that you've been involved in. I know. I think you were involved in the Son of Sam case at one point, right? Yep. 